All right, boom. Today we are going to be watching the entire history of Spider-Man in 70 minutes. I feel like I know the basis of Spider-Man, like, you know, Uncle Ben dying and all the stuff that you kind of know from the movies. I'm curious to see if there's stuff that I missed because I know I've heard the comics of the Spider-Man go deep. Like, there's so many variants of Spider-Man. I don't know if this covers all of it or I don't know if it's just like based on one Spider-Man and it goes from there. But this is why we're watching the video obviously i will leave the original video in the description down below if you don't want to hear about me yapping and without further ado i'll try my best not to pause it because it's already a long video anyway but yeah let's get into it ever wanted to learn the entire history of spider-man from the comics but you wait oh it's from the comics oh it's even better yeah too poor can't be arsed to read the wiki or just hate watch mojo with your very soul to see the journey from a young inexperienced yeah. spider-man to a battle-hardened superhero veteran capable of leading the avengers into battle if i forget Are anything these the avengers? if i leave out your favorite story of spider kid from the 80s or something feel free to tell me in the comments first off no one likes their time being wasted. I could stretch this out and get like a billion dollars in ad revenue, but we all know Spider-Man's origin story. There's no point going over it in tremendous detail. Okay. Peter Parker gets bit by a spider. His uncle gets bit by a bullet. With great power comes great... <laughs> People gets bit by a spider. Peter gets bit by a bullet. <laughs> God damn, okay. We've seen it a million times. Yeah, However, yeah, yeah. a lot of people think that it was Uncle Ben who said that famous line. Whereas in the original comic, Uncle Ben shows up for like two panels, dies off screen, and Peter learns his lesson from a text box. What? Little does Peter know, he is seen crawling out his window by the girl next door, Mary Jane Watson, making her the first ever person to discover Spider-Man's identity. Oh. This origin story was meant to be a one-off deal, but due to the popularity of the character, he was soon given his own main series. Yeah, because I actually heard that they was never going to, like, apparently he... What was the story again? What's his name? Was meant to... He wanted to do a Spider-Man, but then he thought he was joking or something like that. Then he added it into something. And then people loved it or something? Ah, oh, do you know what? I can't remember. Never mind. And followed the daily double life of Peter Parker as he balanced his high school studies with his secret alter ego. He would be constantly picked on by the people at school, especially by Flash Thompson, who, despite being a relentless uh, villain, yeah, right, would become right, Spider-Man's right. number one fan. He would defend his hero no matter what anyone said about him, Damn. even making his own Spider-Man fan club. Completely oblivious that the- I think we kind of saw that in the movies with, you know, I guess in the modern Spider-Man, the Flash kind of like back spider like loves off Spider-Man and all that stuff like that. he's worshipping is the same one he tries to beat up every day. Yeah. After a long day of fighting hardened criminals, Peter would come home to Aunt May, who thought he was just this poor little delicate boy who wouldn't harm a fly. And while Aunt May was just this frail old lady who could be taken out by a paper airplane, underneath she was a very strong spirited fighter who had a lot of wisdom for her nephew. Peter's heroics as Spider-Man would be publicly shamed by J. Jonah Jameson, whose mm -hmm. blind hatred for Spider-Man was really just a cover up for his own self-doubt. As head of the Spider-Man oh. fan club, Flash would speak out against Jameson's biased reporting and even tries to fight him one time. Peter oh. would take pictures of himself as Spider-Man and sell them to Jameson, thus allowing Peter to pay for yeah. his rent. It's also yeah. depressing as hell seeing how a single paycheck is enough for him to pay an entire year's worth of rent. While at Jameson's office, Peter meets a his single pay this so nowadays? Yeah! Betty Brandt. The two are very fond of each other and eventually start dating. However, a spanner is thrown into the works when her brother is brutally murdered and she blames Spider-Man for his death. Oh, Therefore, Peter rah. can never reveal his identity out of fear that she'll despise him. Yeah, to that make makes sense. Even worse, Liz Allen, who was previously one of the people who bullied Peter, does a complete 180 and now will stop at nothing until he's wrapped around her finger. Peter doesn't really give a shit, but Betty gets super jealous and their relationship soon falls apart. After oh. they break up, Aunt May's like, Oh, don't worry, Peter. I know a beautiful girl. Her name is Mary Jane Watson. But Peter's too busy with Spider-Man stuff, and so he declines the offer. There's something very charming the about Peter's early career as Spider-Man. It's light, it's fun, and very nostalgic reading it back now. Seeing this young boy meet all of these iconic characters for the first time. These people who will go on to impact his life in so many ways, Goblin. and he has no idea of it yet. He's dreaming of being a scientist, not knowing that one day that will come true. We get to see Peter make new friends, fall in love for the first time, and watch as he messes it all up. We see the first appearances of all his classic villains, such as Dr. Octopus, Sandman, Electro, and Craven uh, the Hunter. Such tragic characters as Dr. Kirk Connors, who accidentally turns himself crocodile. into a lizard yeah. and tries to eat Spider-Man, only to be cured and return to his loving family. 
or the Scorpion, who Jameson helped create to try and capture Spider-Man, only to be driven insane and turned to a life of crime. There's also the mysterious Green Goblin, whose main goal is just to fuck with Spider-Man. <laughs> Every time Spider-Man would defeat him, he'd go back to his secret lair and it'd be like, oh, who is he? Guess who it's gonna be? And then they just don't tell you. It's also interesting oh, really? to see how little a role Uncle Ben plays in these early issues. His death serves more of an inconvenience to Peter than anything, and after being briefly mentioned in issue one, he's not even brought up again for the next 30 odd issues. Oh, Peter right, because instead... it's in the movies, it's like Uncle Ben's death is like the driving force for Peter, do you know what I mean? Heroes, such as the Avengers, the, the, the reminder Four. sometimes. Sure, he might insult them and get into the odd fight now and again, but deep down, he desperately wants to have their confidence, their respect. In his first fight with Dr. Octopus, Peter gets completely annihilated and feels really ashamed about his defeat. Damn. He's ready to just give everything up until the Human Torch delivers a powerful speech about resilience and beating the odds no matter what. Peter's then inspired to confront Dr. Octopus again and emerges triumphant. Peter's heroic actions come from him just wanting to be better, rather than from a burden of guilt. Mm. These big superhero teams represent where he's trying to get to, both as a hero and as a person. A bunch of Peter's villains come together to form the Sinister Six, but they're so far up their own asses that they fight him one-on-one -on -one instead of as a team, and he wipes the floor with them. Determined to get rid of Spider-Man for good, Jameson commissions a killer robot to hunt him down and huh? capture him. He enlists the roboticist Spencer Smythe to build it, calling it the Spider Slayer. Peter ultimately outsmarts them by making a puppet of himself and tricking them into capturing the puppet. Eventually, Peter graduates from high school, getting a science scholarship at Empire State University. Nice. Unfortunately for Peter, Flash is getting a sports scholarship to the same place, so he'll not be getting rid of him anytime soon. At university, Peter meets some new faces, such as his new classmates, Harry Osborne and Gwen Stacy. Just as Peter is getting used to this new stage in his life, Aunt May falls hideously ill and is rushed to the hospital. This completely uh... throws Peter off, and he's so busy focusing on Aunt May's health that all his new classmates think he's some sort of massive antisocial prick. It doesn't help that Flash Thompson is there to talk shit about him, reaffirming everything that Harry and Gwen already think of him. The Damn. doctors are like, listen mate, your aunt's probably fucking dead. So Peter <laughs> seeks help from Dr. Curtis Connors, aka the Lizard, who tells him of this special serum that can save Aunt May, and it's so unbelievably rare that there's like, one in existence. Peter pawns off all his valuables to pay for it. However, Dr. Octopus conveniently needs the same serum for his own research, and oh. hijacks the shipment before it arrives. Peter tracks down Doc Ock to his underwater base, and manages to steal back the serum that Aunt May needs. But it doesn't matter, because during their fight, the base's structure is so significantly damaged that it collapses on top of them. It's here that we get one of the most iconic Spider-Man moments of all time, where Peter just is trapped now, I... under the machinery, exhausted and alone, moments away from drowning. Knowing that Aunt May will die if she doesn't get the serum, and fueled by the memory of Uncle Ben, Peter defies all odds through sheer willpower alone, oh, finding fuck. the strength to lift an impossible weight and free him from the base's ruins. It's a moment that fully embodies one of Spider-Man's most powerful abilities, his will to always get back up. Peter rushes back to the hospital with the serum and saves Aunt May's life. He's of course relieved, but now has to go back to his university where everyone hates him. Everyone yeah. that is, except Gwen Stacy, who's determined that Peter isn't all bad and maybe just misunderstood. At this moment in time, Peter is not interested in Gwen because he's still hung up over Betty, who's now dating a guy called Ned. Yeah. Yes. That Ned, and she might even be getting oh, married. To him. Oh, oh, but Peter, don't you want to meet Mary Jane Watson? She's a beautiful young lass. Shut up, May. I'm going through my edgy. All women are the same. <laughs> so wait, fate. Mary Jane, Gwen Stacy are all in. The okay, okay, it's, okay. At the same time, we get the first appearance of Norman Osborn, who, yeah, okay. At this point, everyone knows he's the Green Goblin. Norman hatches a plan to find out Spider-Man's identity, and so he just follows him home, and attacks him out in the open for anyone to see. With the element of surprise, he's able to defeat Peter and take him back to his evil lair. Damn. After a villainous speech about how he's gonna put Peter in a cheese grater and make his life misery, Peter manages to get free and the two battle it out. If the goblin escapes, he could go for Aunt May, he could go for Betty, everything is at risk. And so Peter doesn't hold back. He beats him to near death, covers him in a bunch of deadly chemicals, and accidentally sets him on fire. Oh Still shit, by doing the right thing, what? Peter gets Norman to safety. He discovers that the chemicals have messed with Norman's mind, and that he doesn't remember who Peter is, or that he's the Green Goblin. Very convenient, but Peter hands him over to Pretty the convenient. authorities, saying that Norman is innocent, and actually helped him take down the Green Goblin. Norman is admitted to hospital, and Peter comforts Harry over what happened to his father, mm. an act that brings them closer together and sets them down a path of friendship. 
Peter begins to heal his reputation at university and finds himself attracted to Gwen. He's about to make a move when Peter, Mary Jane is here! And in another iconic <laughs> Spider-Man moment, Peter meets Mary Jane for the first time. Okay. He's instantly taken aback. Her beauty, her charm, her carefree attitude. Peter's like, are you Gwen? Respectfully, you can fuck off. And he instantly starts dating Mary Jane. It's not really like an exclusive thing, so Peter is still going for Gwen. The college era of Spider-Man right, is one doing of my favorites. Both, okay. He's equally as nostalgic as his high school days. It took what worked from the previous era and developed it further, resulting in some of the most iconic characters that we all know today. And while old villains were expanded upon, we were introduced to some new ones, such as the Rhino, the Shocker, and the Kingpin. Also, Jameson commissioned Spencer Smythe to create yet another Spider Slayer, which works out just as well as the last one. As right. time went on, Peter's friend group solidified a bit more, with Mary Jane joining the group and Flash slowly losing the bully persona. Nice. Peter finally moved out of Aunt May's house and oh, started wow. sharing a fancy new apartment with Harry. Peter also Fair. grew closer with Gwen, and the two became more romantically involved. But once again, Spider-Man got in the way when, during a fight with Dr. Octopus, Peter suffers complete amnesia and takes days to regain his memory. During this time, he doesn't know his real name or where he lives, and so his absence severely worries his friends and family. Oh. Peter goes to the police department for help, where he meets Gwen's dad, Captain George Stacy. You see, Captain Stacy has been studying Spider-Man during his retirement, and has come to the conclusion that he's an all-round pretty good guy. So when the other officers have doubts about Spider-Man, Captain Stacy comes to his defense and convinces the others to help him. Meanwhile, Harry's looking through Peter's room to find clues of his whereabouts and discovers some of his Spider-Man equipment. Oh, this shit. This leads Harry to put two and two together and come to the realization that Spider-Man kidnapped Peter Parker. <laughs> Not exactly Sherlock Holmes, are you, mate? <laughs> Instantly, word breaks out that Spider-Man has in fact kidnapped Peter Parker while he's in the police department. And they're like, did you? Did you kidnap Peter Parker? No. Just then, Gwen <laughs> rushes in and demands to know where Peter is. Spider-Man's still suffering from amnesia, so he's like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, and escapes before things can escalate. Eventually, Peter gets his memory back through water or something, and returns okay. home to his friends and family. Of course, he needs to think of an excuse. Yeah, so the best yeah. he can come up with is that Spider-Man kidnapped me, but, you know, he's actually a pretty good guy. Mm -hmm. well, that I mean. out, Captain <laughs> Stacy takes Peter to see Gwen, who's over the moon to see him. However, while she's helplessly in love with Peter, she now absolutely detests Spider-Man. Captain uh... Stacy became a recurring character, who was very supportive of his daughter's relationship and was someone that Peter could confide in. This all changed during yet again another battle with Dr. Octopus. During their fight on top of a building, a crowd builds up on the ground below. Captain Stacy arrives at the scene, urging the civilians to get to safety, but it's no use. Things take a turn for the worst when Doc Ock knocks into an abnormally large chimney, sending a mountain of debris hurtling towards a small child. While everyone Does else runs him? away, Captain Stacy lunges towards the boy, sacrificing himself to oh, save him. In his damn. last moment, Stacy reveals that he had figured out Peter's identity and tells him to be there for Gwen when he's gone. Spider-Man is blamed for Captain Stacy's death, because of course he is. With James Even if it's fault, you men should have just not been surrounding the area. Bro did tell you to dip out. It is an opportunity to sway the public against them. And if Gwen hated Spider-Man before, oh, now God. it's like, on sight. If yeah. there was ever any hope of Peter telling her. <laughs> Truth, it's fair. Further driving a massive rift between them. And so begins a series of extremely depressing issues where Gwen moves to England and Peter thinks he's lost her forever. Harry finds himself caught up in a drug ring and overdoses a bunch of times. Oh, the entire wow. city is now strongly against Spider-Man, abusing him at every chance they get. The comics are not PG, are they? Like, damn. And every issue ends up with Peter crying. But among the darkness, there is lightness. During her time in England, Gwen has time to reflect on her father's death. Realizing that her hatred of Spider-Man got in the way of her relationship with Peter, and that she does truly love him. Okay. She comes home to New York, and the two of them are now happier than ever. They go on a romantic vacation to the Savage Land, which oh, wow. goes as well as it sounds. Jameson uh, creates yet another Spider Slayer. Oh, brother. Peter even tries to remove his powers to spend more time with For Gwen. For Gwen? Nah, so, you lost your mind. grows an extra four arms. Once again, he goes to Kurt Connors for help. Morbius gets in the way, fucks the whole thing up, and the lizard goes out of control. But what in the end, the they're fuck? able to use Morbius' blood to control the lizard and get rid of Peter's extra arms. It's here that Gwen is that's at her a, most That's crazy. Peter. They're both deeply in love, the gang's all together, everything's going perfectly. Until she fucking dies. 
Huh? It's no spoiler that the Green Goblin kills Gwen Stacy. Right, because that's how it's an amazing Spider Man. her death makes this story all the more impactful. Just knowing that she's because the way the way they do it in the movies is like it's like time different Spider Man. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, the Amazing Spider Man with Gwen, um, the Spider Man that we know. Who's what is what is the first Spider Man? Harry Maguire. What's it's not Gwen Stacy. It's the redheaded one. I can't remember her name. No matter what, and there's nothing you can do about it. No one said it in his video as well. Mental breakdown brought on by his son's troubles with addiction. Suddenly, right. all of his memories start flooding back, and he instantly resumes his mission to make Peter's life hell. His first uh, stop is at Peter's apartment, where he finds an unsuspecting Gwen Stacy. Peter uh, confronts the goblin on the Brooklyn Bridge, where he throws Gwen to her death. And I guess since she now, licks her head. It's ambiguous whether or not it was the fall or Peter's webbing that killed her, but Roy Thomas, editor of Marvel Comics at the time, basically came out and said, it was the webbing. Chop. Gwen's death really oh, captures really? what death is for a lot of people. It's sudden. It's unfair. The actual event is over quickly, but its effects, the consequences it has on the people around it, stay around for years. The I'm glad the way they did Gwen's death in the Amazing Spider-Man, like when you just when you you think he's gonna get her, and her head just go. I was that that they did that so well. I wish they did like an Amazing Spider-Man three. I can't even lie, but Green Goblin is impaled by his own glider, and Peter is left with no one to blame but himself. In the wake of her friend's death, Mary Jane unravels Mary Jane, her that's it, because it's the, the, the Harry, Harry Maguire, the first Spider-Man, goes out with Mary Jane. And then the amazing Spider-Man is Gwen, and then I can't remember who Zendaya is called in that one. carefree persona, becoming far more serious and emotionally transparent. She and Peter support each other through this time, and ultimately grow closer to one another. Meanwhile, Harry's fucking. figuring out that maybe Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Harry discovers his father's evil lair and tries to avenge him as the new Green Goblin, blowing up their apartment to try and kill Peter. Peter responds by Holy punching cow. him in the face and leaving him for the authorities. Harry is diagnosed as a complete lunatic and is sent to an asylum. Nine Peter months Parker's after Gwen's death, Peter and MJ enter the dating stage or and share month, their you know. first kiss. Finally, something positive in Peter's life, with uh. him and MJ's relationship pulling him out of his depression. He can't stop thinking of her and this is exactly what he needs to... Gwen is back. After Peter convinces himself <laughs> Wait, that he's not what? insane, he's now got to deal with the fact that his dead girlfriend is back and has no idea about his new, very much alive girlfriend, which is just as awkward as it is heartbreaking. After some quick investigating, they find that Gwen's body is still in her grave. So, so this new Gwen, while being timeline. genetically identical, is something else entirely. This storyline marks a beginning of a certain trend in Spider-Man comics starting the series down a path that would result in a very confusing, controversial mess. Okay. Clones. Cl see, this oh. new Gwen Stacy is actually a genetic experiment created by one of Spider-Man's most infamous enemies, the Jackal. Spider-Man's villains have always never had heard these tragic of the backstories. I can't Dr. Lie. Octopus was a scientist whose experiment messed with his head. The lizard was just a family man trying to grow his arm back. And the Jackal is an aunt. A professor at Empire State University, the Jackal fell in love with wait, one of his students wait. and became very jealous of her boyfriend at the time. After her death, he was so heartbroken and used his scientific skills to pull <laughs> her back what from the dead. What the fuck? Head. He then dressed up in a Grinch costume and psychologically tortured Spider-Man with the clone of his dead girlfriend. Oh and if that wasn't enough, my. this next bit's actually a pretty genius plan, he creates a clone of Spider-Man with all of his memories and personality so that from the clone's perspective, he is, is the real one. He then kidnaps the real Spider-Man and switches them about so they have no idea who the clone is. Jackal blows himself up. He's a bitch who cares but what matters is that one of the spider oh, what dies did he call it. him blows himself up he's a bitch who cares but okay fair play is that one of the spider men <laughs> dies with him so which while is it's back to normal there's only one peter parker he's not actually sure if he's the real, the real one or the clone sends him into an existential crisis oh, realizing that mad. she's not actually gwen stacy the clone of gwen leaves new york to become her own person fair i'm sure these clones will never be a problem in the future uh, meanwhile they Jameson are running goes to create yet another spider slayer oh however this God. time spencer smith is he, like to get away with spider this. slayers and tries to kill Jameson, only to end up dying himself. Aunt May wait, 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 what? However, this time, Spencer Smythe is like, fuck your spider slayers, and tries to kill Jameson, only to end up dying himself. Damn. Aunt May almost marries Dr. Octopus. Huh? I can't remember why, and I don't care.
Also, uh -huh. Kurt Connors has beef with this guy called Stegron, who's basically the lizard, but he turned himself into a dinosaur. Kurt's son Billy okay. is kidnapped, and the lizard goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Stegron, who's now got an army of dinosaurs, and Spider-Man's caught in the middle of it. Stegron falls into a river and dies, and Kurt is reunited with his family. <laughs> From this point on, Kurt became Spider-Man's solution to everything. Hey, uh, uh, someone put a bomb on us. Help. The Moonstones. Something to do with the moon? While the whole clone situation puts some strain on Peter and MJ's relationship, they eventually heal things and Peter ends up proposing to her. To okay. which she says, no. She oh. friends on him and moves to Florida. This just so happens to take- <laughs> Damn! in the same issue as the big wheel. Sure, the majority of Peter's college friends are either dead, clinically insane, or in a different state, but at least it's time for him to graduate. Except he's actually denied graduation because he missed one gym class by accident. What? Peter starts dating the black cat, which is oh. great because now he doesn't have to hide his identity or worry about her getting hurt. Harry gets amnesia and is cured of his insanity, so it's hey. like the whole thing never happened. Spider-Man's sent to fucking space and fights one of the most powerful beings in the multiverse. Who? Bit of a step up, but during his cosmic adventure, he gains a cool new black costume, which can transform into whatever he wants with a single thought, making outfit changes so much easier. Upon realising that Black Cat only cares about the spider and not the man, their relationship oh. falls through, just in time for Mary Jane returning home from Florida. Convenient. There was probably another spider slayer in there, built by Smythe's son. Once you read like 800 issues in a week, they all start to blend together. It's 800 in a, a week? It's a crucial point in Peter and MJ's relationship, in which MJ has had enough of hiding the truth and reveals that she's known Peter's secret all along. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. The constant knowledge of Peter risking his life has gotten too much for her, which is why she turned Peter down and left New York. Realizing right. that things are only going to get better if they're honest with each other, the two promise to be there for each other and figure out how their relationship is going to work. Peter gets a little bit freaked out when his new costume starts swinging him around New York while he's asleep, and so he goes to the Fantastic Four to get it checked out. Upon learning that it's actually alive, yeah. Peter has them remove it's it venom. and put it in a tube. It's not that easy though, as the suit soon escapes and forces itself back onto Peter. Struggling to get it off, Peter discovers its main weakness, as the sound of a church bell traumatizes the symbiote, seemingly killing it for good. Despite this, Peter would still wear a cloth version of the black suit, because Black Cat thought it was hot. Did someone say Fair. Spider Slayer? With Smythe dead, Jameson hires Dr. Marla Madison to build another one, but the two actually fall in love and eventually get married. Oh. As a wedding gift, Spider-Man makes out with him. <laughs> What the fuck? What? Blaming Jameson <laughs> what? for what happened to him, the Scorpion kidnaps Marla in an attempt at revenge, but his plan is short-lived and he's stopped by Spider-Man. Spider-Man also fights alongside the mercenary Silver Sable, taking down such evil villains as oh, the Black bad. Fox, the Jack-O-Lantern, and the US government. As Peter the and MJ get closer and closer, Peter realises that this is the person who he wants to spend the rest of his life with. Okay. And after a massive kick in the balls of a cliffhanger, we get to the next issue, where MJ says, Yes! Hey. Okay, she initially turns him down, yet again, but oh. we soon learn that she's just afraid of marriage because of how her parents turned out. Everyone oh. in her family ran out on her and tried to escape their responsibilities, so it's almost in her nature to run away from big decisions like this. But after learning that it's not a bad thing to commit to someone you love, MJ accepts Peter's proposal. And so it's time for Spider-Man to get married. Wedding guests include Aunt May, Flash, Harry, Jameson, Marla, Robbie Robertson of the Daily Bugle, MJ's Aunt Anna, and Betty. No, Ned. Ned, uh, Ned died. Peter Wait, and MJ what, when did an Ned die? As newlywed husband and wife. Damn. This is something I love about the Spider-Man comics from, well, before 2007. For the most part, they let Peter grow, not just physically from a teenager to an adult, but as a person as well. Sure, he still has his flaws, as any character should, but you can see him become more mature. You can see how he's learned and improved from his years of being a superhero. Spider-Man's right. always been about relatability, and sure, him having his life out of order or being really unlucky is part of it, but it's his growth that's the most relatable aspect for me. Like all of us, Peter gets anxious and uncertain about each new chapter of his life, but he still accepts the change and embraces it. Mm. Whether it's going to college, having to find a whole new group of friends, graduation, choosing the person you're going to spend the rest of your life with, married life, parenthood, accepting and moving on from the death of a loved one. If there's mm. one thing I hope this video illustrates, it's Perry, that change have kids. is key to Spider-Man.
Shortly after their honeymoon, Peter and MJ are tormented by Kraven the Hunter, who, after a lifetime of being defeated and humiliated by Spider-Man, hatches a plan to kill him and redeem his honour as a hunter. In the past, Kraven would use spears, darts, all sorts of traditional hunting equipment. I guess he's changed it up. Lately? So Kraven abandons his usual set of tools in favour of a gun, which he uses Fair. to just straight up fucking murder Spider-Man. Wait, Craven what? Craven buries Spider-Man's body himself, puts on a Spider-Man costume, and stands over his grave in what is possibly one of the most coldest villain moments of all time. Oh, shit. But he doesn't shit. just stop there. He then goes around doing Spider-Man's job for him, going so far as to kill people, thus ruining Spider-Man's reputation. The only person he doesn't fool is Mary Jane, who instantly sees through Craven's disguise. After a series of visual metaphors, which definitely scarred any kids reading it at the time, Peter uses his indomitable will and love for MJ to dig the way out of his own grave. Oh, he goes to shit. confront Craven, but Craven refuses to fight back. Sure, Spider-Man may still be alive, but it doesn't matter. He's ruined his reputation. superior and made his point that uh. he was worthy of the title Craven the Hunter and his honour was restored. He leaves a confession for the police, clearing Spider-Man's name, and with that, Craven shoots himself in the head. <laughs> Both this story and the death of Jean DeWolf arc marked a darker time for Spider-Man. With brutal deaths and disturbing imagery, Spider-Man comics were at their most mature. But they oh, weren't just shit. dark and edgy for the sake of it. They were grounded in character and the themes of morality, revenge, flaws in the system, all of which produced some of the most memorable Spider-Man stories to date. Shortly after, we reach Amazing Spider-Man issue 300, featuring the first appearance of Venom. Already traumatised by her run-in with Kraven, MJ comes home to find this. No matter the amount of life-threatening situations she's been in, MJ has always remained strong in the face of danger, so Peter is determined to find out what could have possibly made her feel so helpless. Upon confronting this strange new creature, we get a look at his tragic backstory. Eddie Brock was just Eddie a Brock. reporter for the Daily Globe, one of the Daily Bugle's competitors. After Spider-Man exposed his fraudulent journalism, Eddie's career was made into a laughingstock, and with his life completely ruined, he had no other option but just to off himself. Raised as a Catholic, however, Eddie believed suicide to be a mortal sin. Right. So before he took his own life, he went to a church to pray for forgiveness. Oh, the bro. same church in which Spider-Man was fighting the symbiote. It latched onto Eddie, feeding off his humiliation and desire for revenge, transforming him into Venom. And in another contender for the coldest villain moments of all time, Venom webs Spider-Man to that same church bell, so that when midnight strikes and the bell starts to ring, Spider-Man will be squished into tiny pieces, oh, thus shit. exercising him. Spider-Man breaks free through the power of bullshit and defeats <laughs> Venom by throwing him into the ground. He takes Eddie to the Fantastic Four, who put him in a tube and ship him off to some gulag. With MJ Bruh. still traumatised by Venom, Peter ditches his black costume in favour of his classic The thing classic is, though, the black costume is probably the best one. I can't even lie that, but especially like in the game and stuff. Oh, fire. Blue. Meanwhile, Aunt May worries that she's been getting in the way of her nephew's marriage and distances herself from everyone. Right, MJ okay. reassures her that they do still need her and still want her as part of their life, yeah, bringing so. them closer than ever. May also finds a new partner by the name of Nathan. He's a bit of a knob, but the two have some decent chemistry and he's vital for May to move on from her dead husband, Fair. and he's dead. Also, Black oh. Cat finds out that Peter's now married to MJ and starts dating Flash just to mess with him. <laughs> Alright, it's the fucking 90s. A lot of people really don't like this era because of all the clones and you know marvel and dc were just trying to outdo each other in terms of who could make the most weirdest most edgiest shit imaginable oh like really Kane, a rejected clone of spider-man who uses his spider powers to stick his hand to people's faces and rip them off what you the also have fuck? cletus cassidy a serial killer who shares a cell with eddie brock when the venom symbiote has a baby it latches on to cletus and he becomes the superpowered uh... mass murderer known as carnage after harry had got his amnesia things were working out for him he married Liz from Peter's high school. Nice. The two had a son called Normie. Nice. You know, he's, having a, he's having a gay old time. That is until the X-Men do some bullshit that messes with everyone's heads. And now and all of his goblin back. memories are restored. Uh, okay. And of course you'd expect him to go goblin mode on everyone and Spider-Man would have to stop him. But no. It's actually a pleasant surprise when Harry doesn't instantly turn evil and instead goes round trying to be a superhero. Unfortunately, oh. it doesn't last long as Harry is repeatedly haunted by visions of his dead father oh. and eventually the Green Goblin persona takes over. Fuck. Once again determined to avenge his father, the Goblin confronts Peter and tries to blow him up. During the fights, Harry's real personality starts to fight the Goblin and he keeps switching between the two personas. Oh, Peter tries to get Harry to fight it, but it's no use. 
After a fierce battle, Peter surrenders himself to the goblin, saying that the only way this ends is if one of them dies. Even though he has every advantage, the goblin can't bring himself to kill Peter, proving that Harry's still in there and still fighting to do the right thing. The goblin flees the scene and spends the next 12 issues swimming in goblin juice, making himself stronger, crazier, and diluting what's left of Harry's personality. Oh, what about his but kid? while this special juice does enhance him, it's also killing him from the inside. He uh... then starts stalking Peter, following him in the street or at the Daily Bugle, threatening to give up his identity. He even goes so far as to bring Mary Jane to the same place that Gwen died just as Yo! a way of fucking with him. Peter takes the <laughs> bait the and hell? confronts him, still hopeful that his old friend can be redeemed. The goblin lures Peter to a building rigged with explosives and drugs Peter so that he can barely move. It's clear to him that their rivalry will go on forever, so the goblin plans for both of them to die in the explosion. That way he'll have avenged his father's death while also ending his own mental suffering. Peter oh, is fucked shit. and can do nothing but lie there and wait to be blown up. However, the day is saved by MJ, who has brought Harry's son with her in an attempt to oh, break through to him. Upon realising that what? his son is about to be turned to ash, Harry's personality snaps back. He instantly gets MJ and Normie to safety, realises he forgot about Peter, and saves him as well. Oh, but nice, the Goblin okay. formula has taken too much of a toll on his body, so he and dies? Harry collapses. Harry thanks Peter for believing in him and lets him know that no matter what happened between them, he still considers him his best friend. He holds Peter's hand and smiles before succumbing to his injuries and dying. As Peter grieves his friend's death, the issue ends with a picture of Peter and Harry in their college days, a simpler, happier time before any of this happened. All right, it's time for the clone saga. Now this event was stretched over several years and has a fuck ton of characters, so it was a nightmare to navigate. For this video, I did want to actually read everything myself and not just rely on the wiki, but my God, it helped. If the story just took place in one comic and was really, really long, then sure, that's fine. But yeah. it took place back and forth between the four concurrent Spider-Man series at the time. Plus oh, wow. the 30 something other series that the story was planted in between. And you know what? I didn't actually have to read, like, half of these. Most of them have fuck all to do with the main story, but that's what Wikipedia told me. Maybe the teachers were right about Wikipedia all along. The actual main story <laughs> is pretty simple if you remove, like, half the stuff they threw in there. That... Remember that clone of Spider-Man that the Jackal used to fuck with him? Turns yeah. out he didn't die, and has actually been living in secret under the name of Ben Riley. After doing a fancy DNA test, it's revealed that our Peter, the one we've been following for the past 30 odd years, is in fact the clone, oh, and that Ben is actually the original Peter Parker from those very first oh, issues. Oh shit! Also, MJ is pregnant. Another existential crisis ensues, but you know what? This is actually kind of good news. Now that there's another Spider-Man, Peter can now focus more on his family and dedicate most of his time to be a dad. Sure, so Peter true. retires from being a superhero and lets Ben take his place as the new Spider-Man. Some stuff happens. Damn. Venom, clonage, maximum clonage. Oh shit. They got speedball in this? And then at the end, Who's it's speedball? revealed that Norman Osborn is alive and he's been pulling the strings this whole time. Huh? Turns out Norman faked the DNA test because why not? Fuck you. And Peter <laughs> is actually the original. This is proven when during a final confrontation with Osborn, Ben sacrifices himself to save Peter and his body turns to ash. The oh. clone saga then ends on a very tragic note. Peter and MJ's child is stillborn, which is probably oh, one of the most traumatic experiences God. any couple can have. Why add this to the list of tragedies they've faced? Well, the story is that Marvel thought that Peter having a child would age him up too much, and the change would be too much for the readers without realising that's the whole fucking point. And this comes right so after- So you gave him a stillborn? What the Peter fuck? Aunt May gives them a speech about how much of a responsibility it is to raise a child. Responsibility? Spider-Man? The Clone Saga may have been a controversial, convoluted mess, but in the midst of all the chaos, we got Amazing Spider-Man 400, oh, which is just okay. an absolutely beautiful issue and marked one of the biggest changes in Peter Parker's life. Like Aunt what? May's been on the cusp of death for the, the past uh, 30 years, and having part. got another illness, it's clear she's not going to last much longer. Yeah. She's advised to stay in bed and rest, but May wants to make the most of the time she has left with Peter, and they visit the top of the Empire State Building. Much to Peter's surprise, May reveals that she's known he was Spider-Man man for a very long time oh, and damn. says that Uncle Ben would have been proud of him. Now weaker than ever, Peter takes May home to rest. When Peter tries to call the doctor, May refuses. She knows that she's way past her time, but she just held on that little bit longer so she could say her goodbye to Peter. Oh, While she knows her. he won't take it well, she reassures him that she's had a good long life and that she couldn't be prouder of the kind, decent soul that Peter has always been. 
MJ and Aunt Anna arrive to find a devastated Peter grieving over May's body, and they break down into tears together. Oh, bless. Aunt May is buried next to Uncle Ben, and Peter accepts yet another inevitability of life. The 90s marked the last real progression in Peter's stages of life. He'd gone from an angsty teenager who lived in his Aunt May's house and had no one to confide in, to a mature, married man who'd lost more than he deserved, yeah. but had loved ones to support him and be honest with. Yeah. This was of course ruined by a number of decisions made by Marvel in the dying breath of the 90s. What New do writers you mean? step in. Aunt oh, May's back. Uh -huh. Turns out she didn't actually die and blames her death on rap music? The fuck? What? Also, she doesn't what? know that Peter is Spider-Man because that wasn't her, that was some actress clone thing that the Green Goblin made. MJ goes on a plane and gets blown up, but it turns out she actually wasn't on the plane and she got kidnapped. Peter's uh... like, okay, I don't care, and starts kissing this teenager. Okay, I'm doing this run a disservice by explaining it like this, but it more or less cements a trend in Spider-Man comics of... One, shaking things up for no other reason than just trying to get an increase in sales, which never right. actually ends up working. And two, refusing to let Peter grow, or actively regressing his character in an attempt to make him more relatable? Peter saves MJ from the kidnapper, to which she uncharacteristically says that they need to go on a break, and the They're two married. Of them separate. Not the brightest of times, but here's when J. Michael Straczynski comes in. At the start of the 21st century, Straczynski took over Amazing Spider-Man and was like, alright, time to fix this mess. First things first, get Peter and MJ back together. Right, but makes don't just sense. have them instantly come back. Make the most of their time apart, exploring why it is they need each other and so that when they do reunite, it's satisfying and it's earned. Right. This is Spider-Man in his absolute prime. Having become a teacher at his old school, Peter is able to express his passion for science while helping the same vulnerable kids that he used to be. His sense of responsibility is in full swing, going out of his way to help impoverished students and making a genuinely positive impact on the neighborhood, not just by punching a villain in the face, but by being compassionate and just putting in the effort. Less spider, more man. His years of crime fighting are evident in the way that he tackles problems. He's still got that witty trickster's edge from Stan's original comics, mm. he's still tremendously unlucky and suffers hard times, but there's always that glimmer of hope in there somewhere. Some people don't like what Straczynski did with the spider totem stuff, suggesting that Peter's powers came from a magical spider god. I for one can't get enough of it, but it's important to note that he's more just posing a question rather than giving a concrete explanation. One of the right. best things that he did was completely revamp the character of Aunt May. In the past, there were signs of her internal strength, which is something issue 400 understood, but a lot of the times it would be forgotten and she'd be reduced to this weak old lady who would die from shock if she ever found out her nephew's secret. Straczynski understood that for someone to take in a child that wasn't originally hers, raise him despite all of the other tragedies in her life, watch as the love of her life is gunned down in front of her, watch yeah, as her nephew in front suffers of her. loss after loss, and feel like she can't talk to him about it. Try to find comfort in someone new, only to have them raped away from her, yeah. to suffer through the loneliness of old age, and even then, to still keep going? A life like that would require absolute, unparalleled strength, and something like Peter being Spider-Man wouldn't change that. Mm, when May discovers true. Peter's secret by accident, she's realistically in shock. But after having time to process it, the two sit down and have a lengthy conversation about everything they've been through, all of the years they've lost to a lie, and how Aunt May just thought he was gay the whole time. This is <laughs> also the first time that the Great Power, Great Responsibility line was attributed to Uncle Ben, and was no longer stuck in that little text box. A bunch of cool stuff happens, Oh, some raw. not so cool stuff happens, not his fault. Peter fights the Spider Queen whose kiss gives him all sorts of new powers, spider such as organic queen. webbing out of his wrist. Peter then dies and comes back to life. Don't worry about it. He also fights a villain called Paste Pot Pete, and upon oh. hearing this ridiculous name, bursts out into so much laughter <laughs> that he can no longer fight the villain. Things really start to change when, after a villain attacks their homes and leaves Peter, MJ, and Aunt May homeless, they're invited to live with the Avengers. They don't oh. have to worry about money anymore. Peter becomes close to Iron Man and becomes his right-hand man. Aunt May's kind of got a thing going on with Jarvis. And then Speedball. Old fucking Speedball. Comes along and ruins everything. If you don't know, I'm talking about the massive civil war event of 2006. It kicks off when a bunch of inexperienced superheroes attempt to stop a team of supervillains, but the whole thing goes sideways and ends up causing a devastating amount of civilian casualties. Oh, this shit. leads the government to rethink how they should treat superheroes, and Peter is left with a choice. He can either give up his secret identity to the government and become their little errand boy, or oh, he and his family can be hunted down and put in a hell prison. Oh, <laughs> and so 
being his right hand man, Peter goes along with him, right. an act that he would come to regret so very, very much. It's important to note that Peter doesn't just go along with Iron Man because, oh, it's Iron Man. After what happened with Speedball, he genuinely does believe that superheroes need to be trusted and that this is one step in the right direction. Okay. However, out of all the people who are on Iron Man's team, all the heroes who are publicly in support of the government, Peter's the only one with a secret identity. So, to practice what they uh... preach and get the public on their side, they ask Peter to reveal his identity to the world. If you think this is stupid, Peter does too. But after being convinced by his loved ones that this is the right thing to do, and he that this would demonstrate responsibility for his actions, Peter accepts. And so, in a moment he's been dreading ever since he was a teenager, oh, Spider-Man reveals his identity on live television. Peter's whole life goes to shit. He's abused by the public, his family is hunted down, Jameson what? tries to sue him for like two trillion dollars. The only real people who stand up for him are Flash Thompson and Betty, but that's basically it. Still, Peter made a promise and continues to hunt down those who defy the government, even though it kills him inside. Upon seeing the hell prison where they're keeping all of the unregistered superheroes, Peter reaches the final straw and turns against Iron Man. This is quite difficult as they still live in Avengers Tower, so after moving his family to a dodgy motel, Peter joins Captain America to fight for the side of freedom. Right. From the shadows, Kingpin, along with many other of Spider-Man's villains, start a plot to kill Peter and his family. In the wake of the Civil War, oh, Captain shit. America is shot dead, and Peter uh? barely makes it out alive. He returns to MJ and Aunt May, only for one of the Kingpin's men to open fire on them. Aunt May is hit instead of Peter, and Damn. Peter rushes her to the hospital. While May desperately clings to life, Peter brutally tracks down everyone responsible for the incident, which leads him right to the Kingpin. Breaking into the prison he's held in, Peter humiliates the Kingpin, using his raw strength and no longer pulling his punches, setting an example of what happens when you come after Spider-Man's family. Fuck. Without his condition getting worse and worse, Peter tries to get help from everyone he can think of. He goes to Iron Man, but Iron Man's like, no, die. And so he goes to Doctor Strange, who has literal magic that can raise people from the dead. That's not like, in a movie. Oh, I'm sorry, man, I can't help oh, you. Oh, I've always never first time. And so with no one else to turn to, Peter thinks, ah, the devil. It's here we get one more huh? day. It's not exactly a groundbreaking opinion to say that this is the worst thing humanity has ever produced in the history of anything ever. Oh, a wow. certain someone at Marvel didn't want Peter and MJ to be married, and so this story was created to wreck on like 40 years of history and assassinate Peter's character. And even though I despise it with every fiber of my being, and it makes me want to devolve myself into a fish and go live in the sea, it's actually not that bad. Hear me out. <laughs> okay. The actual presentation, how this story is told, is actually all right. And in some places, dare I say, actually kind of beautiful. The devil, aka Mephisto, shows up and gives Peter a deal. He will save Aunt May's life. He will make everyone forget Spider-Man's identity. Marriage. He'll provide a fresh new start for all of the characters on the condition that Peter and MJ are no longer married. In what, what is possibly the, the worst divorce of all time, Peter and MJ's marriage will be erased from history. They will have no memory that anything has changed, and they will spend the rest of their days apart from one another, living with an unbearable emptiness in their souls which longs for a love they won't even know existed. That's Instead of accepting what happened to Aunt May, who, as much as I love her character, was way past her expiration date, yeah, yeah, not yeah, to mention yeah, yeah. that she would definitely be against sacrificing her beloved nephew's happiness, yeah. Peter says, Okay. Sure, he's reluctant to do it, but he still does it anyway. And so Peter and MJ have 24 hours left to spend with each other. And this bit's actually kind Does of beautifully written. <laughs> It's almost as if Straczynski is saying, hey, I don't want to do this, but there's nothing I can do. Even MJ's like, what are we doing? This is stupid. If you swap out Mephisto for Marvel editorial, you can really identify with the characters and the situation they're forced into. Having developed these characters over the course of his run, building up a genuinely realistic human relationship between them, Straczynski is able to make their last moments together very touching and impactful. And Fuck. so a giant, infuriating, big red fuck you reset button is pressed, pretty much erasing decades of character development. That's like half an hour of this video. Gone. Mary Jane is now the ex-girlfriend of Peter Parker, for reasons unknown. Aunt May's alive and well, has no idea Peter is Spider-Man. Are you really gonna do this a third time, uh -huh. Marvel? Also, Harry's back. Way to negate that touching moment. But at the end of the day, it's a comic book I didn't like. It happened like... 15 odd years ago and hey you gotta take the bad with the good for so every Craven's now? last hunt there's a one more day for every beautifully written character piece there's a bite in the fucking ass at least <laughs> stan lee liked it 
And so begins a brand new day. An editorial attempt to wipe the slate clean and get Peter back to his roots. You know, he's young, he's cool, he's got his life out of order, he sleeps around, he doesn't have a job, He's back at his Aunt May's house. God, this physically hurts. We get new villains such as Mr. Negative, a super powered uh, crime lord whose touch can either games. heal people or corrupt them. Oh, There's damn, also I didn't Overdrive, even heal people. Freak, Menace, Paper Doll, Screwball, Barack Obama's in this. <laughs> Flash has returned what? from the war in Iraq, having lost both of his legs. Oh. Aunt May's now volunteering at a homeless shelter, which is coincidentally run by Mr. Negative in disguise. Also, she's I dating J. Jonah Jameson's dad. And speaking of J. Jonah Jameson, he's essentially fired after the Daily Bugle is bought out by another company. And nice. so, leaving his career in journalism behind, he decides to run for mayor. His first course of action upon being elected is to publicly fund a death squad to capture Spider-Man. Oh, brother. A spider slayers and yeah these first few issues suffer from the whiplash of the new status quo but once it sinks in and you get used to it there are some pretty good stories here's one that's really fucked up eddie brock starts to have doubts about the venom symbiote which is bad for the symbiote because it needs a host to survive right. and so it plants memories in eddie's head convincing him that he has terminal cancer and that venom is the only thing keeping him alive oh, this psychological shit. effect then leads to him actually getting cancer to which the venom symbiote is like oh shit and ditches him leaving him <laughs> to die of cancer the what symbiote then goes on to bond with mac gargan aka the scorpion creating a all new powerful venom with very little time left to live eddie wants to make peace before he dies and starts volunteering at the same shelter as aunt may during his time there, he comes in contact with Mr. Negative, whose touch completely heals Eddie of his oh, cancer. Wow. Eddie is over the moon, just in time for the new Venom to show up and start trashing the place. Upon meeting its old host, the symbiote is like, alright Gargan, see ya, and starts trying to bond with Eddie again. When the Venom symbiote fuses with the special healing cells still left in Eddie's body, a new symbiote is created, transforming Eddie into the new anti-Venom. With the help of Spider-Man, Anti-Venom right. takes down Venom and goes off on a mission to save the world or something. It's here we reach Amazing Spider-Man issue 600, okay. which marked a very special occasion, the wedding of Aunt May and J. Jameson Sr. But before Peter can attend, he has to deal with a brand new Dr. Octopus. You see, while Otto has his robot arms, he himself is just a regular guy. And after a lifetime of fighting Spider-Man, each punch to the face has resulted in a series of traumatic brain injuries, leaving that makes him sense. to be diagnosed with less than a year to live. Oh, damn. And just like Eddie, he doesn't want his legacy to be that of villainy. He wants to leave the people of New York with something positive, and so he creates an army of Octobots and spreads them all about the city, psychically connecting them to every appliance, every mode of transport, thus creating a perfect system where everything runs on time without any issues. But okay. because this system is controlled by his subconscious, Otto's hatred for Spider-Man starts to corrupt the city, and all of its appliances uh... start blowing up in an attempt to kill him. Spider-Man tracks Otto to his lair, where he finds him in a disturbing, zombified state his new suit keeping him alive while adding four extra tentacles. Spider-Man manages to defeat him by plugging his own brain into the system and overriding Otto's so-called perfect city. Otto escapes by the skin of his teeth, and Peter goes home to prepare for Aunt May's wedding. The ceremony is actually really sweet. Peter walks his oh, aunt down sec. the aisle. My food's on the way. Mayor Jameson gives a very thoughtful, kind of insulting speech. And insulting. the marriage becomes official, making Peter and Jameson technically related. Aunt <laughs> May throws her bouquet, the tradition being that whoever catches it will be the next to get married, which is then caught by none other than Mary mm -hmm. Jane Watson. But this happy, wholesome time doesn't last I knew forever. It. We get an incredibly sad story about the rhino, who has abandoned crime completely and has oh. a steady job and loving wife. And it's really That's sweet good. hearing him talk about his wife, how he'll do anything for her, making it all the more devastating when his wife is killed right in front of him. The oh. rhino believes it to be a punishment for thinking he could have a normal life, and turns back to his life of crime. Kurt Connors starts losing his mind and transforms into the lizard once more, brutally killing a bunch of people in his lab. In order to get rid of Kurt completely, the lizard tracks down Kurt's son, Billy, and prepares to kill him as well. Oh, Spider-Man is too late to rescue him, and while Kurt's consciousness begs the lizard to stop, he can do nothing but watch as he eats his own son. Oh, With this sacrifice, shit. the lizard sheds into a new form, and Kurt Connors is truly dead. He escapes into the shadows while Spider-Man is left utterly defeated. 
And because Peter can't catch a break, Craven the Hunter is brought back from the dead. What? He's resurrected by his wife and daughter, who stabbed Spider-Man through the heart in a ritualistic sacrifice. But Craven is like, why the fuck did you bring me back? I was happy with my whole big sacrifice thing, and then you fucking palpatined me. And to make things worse, they got the wrong Spider-Man. It was actually Kane, Spider-Man's edgy clone from the 90s. Oh. This mistake has corrupted the sacrifice and has actually put a curse on Kraven, making him immortal until he's killed by none other than Spider-Man's hand. And so Spider -Man we have a man who wants to die, kill. who can only be killed by a man who hates killing. Yeah. Kraven begs Peter to kill him, but Peter refuses. He tells Kraven to treat his resurrection as a second chance and use it to do some good. And so Craven does exactly that. He moves to the Savage Land to start a new life, although he's still salty about his family resurrecting him, and so he kills them. It's around this Damn. time that Peter starts dating forensic scientist and friend of Harry Osborn, Carly Cooper. Also, okay. Marla puts in a good word for Peter at the tech company Horizon Labs, and Peter is hired as a member of their think tank. For once in his life, he's making a really good salary. There are no set hours, so him disappearing as Spider-Man won't be a problem. That's and good. most importantly, he can once again express his love for science, fulfilling the dreams he had all the way back when he was a teenager. That's Peter good. Peter impresses his new boss by essentially just repackaging old Spider-Man inventions into new consumer-friendly devices. Meanwhile, the US government removes the symbiote from Mac Gargan and gives it to their best military veteran, oh, great. Flash Thompson. Flash becomes oh. Agent Venom, giving him the power to walk again, as he performs a series of missions for the US military. All while behind the scenes, Dr. Octopus is beginning his final master plan. Now I know what you're thinking, there hasn't been another Spider Slayer in a while. Oh shit, Alistair Smythe, son of Spencer <laughs> Smythe, has returned, calling himself the Spider Slayer, <laughs> and is seeking vengeance for his father's death. To he does is kind of cold to kill though. anyone who Jameson's ever loved or has any connection with whatsoever, which, now that they're family, includes Peter. Oh, to help great. him with this goal, the Spider Slayer develops a army of cyborg minions and recruits Mac Gargan, who shares the desire for revenge against Jameson. Smythe gives him an upgraded version of the Scorpion suit and sends him to keep Spider-Man busy. The cyborg minions are sent after Aunt May, Jay, Marla, the Daily Bugle, all Fuck. in separate places that Spider-Man couldn't possibly be in at once. Right. And then he remembers, oh wait, I'm part of the Avengers, why don't I just call them for help? And so he calls them up, and the person on the other end of the phone is Squirrel Girl, who completely ignores all of his requests, to which Spider-Man is like, well, I'm fucked. Surprisingly, what Squirrel Girl fuck? goes through in the end, by okay. passing his message over to the real Avengers, who all race to save Spider-Man's loved ones. Nice, However, nice, nice. they soon discover that Smythe programmed the cyborgs with a form of Spider-Sense. Thus, they're able to detect attacks before they happen oh, and crap. overpower the Avengers. If they want to stand a chance, they've got to get rid of that Spider-Sense. And so Spider-Man races back to Horizon Labs to develop some way of disabling it. He manages to whip up a neurowave transmitter bioelectrical magical thing that will cover the whole city. <laughs> but the most important thing is that Spider-Man has to be away from the device once it activates, or it'll fry his spider sense oh, too. Oh, that makes sense. The device, he's confronted by the Scorpion, who destroys Spider-Man's controls, meaning he can no longer activate it remotely. And so Peter's like, fuck it and activates it anyway, severely weakening the Spider Slayer army, but then also obviously him as well. barbecuing his own spider sense. Permanently? With his plan ruined and no one to back him up, a desperate Smythe tries to kill Jameson himself. Just as he's about to tear a hole in Jameson's chest, Marla throws herself in front of him, Fuck, sacrificing herself to save Damn. her husband. In her last moments, Marla urges Jameson not to waste any more of his life on hate. As she dies in his arms, Jameson refuses to blame Spider-Man for what happened, and puts full blame on himself. Hey, After Marla's time. funeral, Spider-Man makes a vow that from now on, no one will die under his watch. Meanwhile, Anti-Venom finds out that Martin Lee, the head of the homeless shelter, is in fact Mr. Negative, okay. and so he goes to take him out, only to be interrupted by Spider-Man. Eddie tries to tell Peter that Martin Lee is Mr. Negative, but Peter doesn't believe him. Eddie's like, alright then, webs him to a guy's ass, and goes to confront Mr. Negative himself. Okay. When Mr. Negative's true identity is exposed, Peter's like, oh shit. Fair enough. <laughs> All while Dr. Octopus completes the finishing touches to his final plan, secretly launching a number of satellites into orbit. And as if Peter joining Horizon Labs wasn't enough, he's about to fulfill another dream from those early issues, joining the Fantastic Four. 
In the past, he may have broken into the Baxter building, beat the shit out of them, and was like, gave me money, but he was doing it all wrong. Instead, all he had to do was be patient and just wait for the human torch to die, and then a spot would Bruh. open up for him. In all seriousness, Johnny Storm sacrifices himself to save the entire universe. In Fair. a series of recordings he made in case of his death, he asks Peter to take his place on the Fantastic Four, to which Peter gladly accepts. However, it's not oh, the Fantastic Four that's... anymore. They've renamed it to the Future Foundation. Now oh, a member okay. of the Avengers and Thor? the Future Foundation, and oh, having a full-time okay. job at Horizon Labs, Peter's got barely any time to spend with his girlfriend Carly. Fortunately, Carly's job as a forensic scientist requires her to be on call 24-7. Okay, so they're both so busy. has to leave a lot of the time, allowing Peter to go off and be Spider-Man. And you know what? For the first time since his marriage was torn away from him, Peter's life seems to be on track. Bless to replace him. his spider sense, he's taking lessons from Shang-Chi, who is teaching him spider foo. He's also expanded his equipment, he's got voice command web shooters, a stealth suit, a bulletproof suit, his Damn. future foundation suit, and his relationship with Carly is going pretty well. No that my. is, until she gets stuck to the ceiling. Everyone in New York is now mysteriously woken up with spider powers. Whoa. Just a heads up, this is about to get a little bit complicated. As part of a massive experiment, the Jackal has spent the last couple of months covering this city with his own little spider bed bugs, all of which carrying a spider virus. Also, he's resurrected Kane and turned him into a giant tarantula to Jesus. serve as his right-hand man. Also, he's captured Captain America and turned him into another big tarantula to Jesus. serve as his left-hand man. The city is quarantined, and all of the bridges are blocked off to prevent this spider virus from spreading to the rest of the world. While the majority of citizens are decent people who only use their powers for good, there is a certain vocal minority who'd rather use them for chaos. And so I'm sure that's a lot of people. the next phase of his plan to round up all of the gangs in New York, give them Spider-Man costumes, and so when the Avengers show up to try and fight them, they won't be able to recognize the real Spider-Man, <laughs> and they'll beat him up as well. This Damn. guy just exists to fuck with Spider-Man. Oh, honestly. It's genius. Peter gets tired of being beaten up by his teammates, and ditches his costume. Pretending to be yet another person who woke up with spider powers, Peter rallies the good citizens of New York to make a stand and fight all of the gang members. That's it smart. now seems that every person in Peter's life, even Jay Jameson has spider powers. Oh, wow. Every person except Mary Jane. Oh, Anna wow. May, but she's out of town. Carly yeah, gets a little oh, suspicious okay. and thinks that Peter is a little too good with his spider powers. The Jackal sends Captain America to break through the blockades and let the virus spread. In response, the government deploys Flash to capture him, and his mission is a success. Flash then uses the Venom symbiote to disguise himself as Captain America's tarantula form and returns back to the Jackal undercover. Everything's going according to plan until suddenly everyone in New York mutates, turning into these massive spiders. What it's here we learn that the Jackal isn't actually the mastermind behind this whole thing. No, that title belongs to the Spider Queen, who used the Jackal's skills to develop a virus, connect it to the spider totem shit that Straczynski was on about, in order to create her a massive spider oh, army. What However, the her fuck? plan is interrupted by Anti Venom, who's going about using his powers to cure the giant spider. Oh, nice. So, the queen Queen sends Captain America, who is actually just Flash in disguise, to go and kill Anti-Venom. Mm -hmm. Flash, of course, snakes her and takes Anti-Venom to Horizon Labs, where they can use Anti-Venom's healing qualities to develop a cure for the spider virus. The Queen's like, shit, that's not good, and sends Kane to sabotage the cure. Spider-Man then tries to protect Anti-Venom, but he's completely overpowered by Kane and laid to waste. Just then, Horizon Labs, along with the Future Foundation, creates a device that returns Spider-Man's spider sense. Spider oh, nice. Spider sense and spider foo throws Kane into the Anti-Venom juice and turns him back into a human. The Queen finds out what happened, gets really angry, fucking kills the jackal. He was oh just sitting there, man. What did he do? He turns <laughs> into a giant spider monster. Oh. Both Flash and a now cured Captain America confront the giant spider queen, but it's no use, and she starts causing devastation all across the city, surrounded by her massive army of New York spider people. Horizon Labs now has a cure, but they just need a way to distribute it. And so Peter's like, hold up, remember that time when Dr. Octopus connected to everything in the city with his little octobots? Why don't we just do that, but with the cure? And so Peter connects his brain to Otto's system. The Queen sends her army after him, but they're held back by Mary Jane Watson, whose spider powers were merely delayed due to years of her and Peter doing stuff. 
Oh. Not as close as I can describe it without risking monetization. Oh, okay. He's in the Octobots. MJ says that she loves him, but he doesn't hear her, so fuck you. Kane comes Fair. in clutch at the last minute, now dressed in Peter's stealth suit, just fucking launches himself into her mouth, which blows her up into a million pieces and scatters what? her brains all across the city. The day is saved, everyone is returned to normal, Jesus. and Carly breaks up with Peter because she's figured out that he's Spider-Man. But hey, don't worry about it. Spider Island, the end. And with these final few stories, Peter's journey as Spider-Man is slowly but surely coming to a close. Dr. Octopus activates his final plan, an array of satellites covering the globe which accelerates the effect of global warming. As oh, billions wow. of people burn, Otto turns it off and is like, just kidding, that's what's gonna happen to the Earth if we don't do something about it. <laughs> and so his final gift to the world is to actually reverse global warming. Maybe just lead with that, but okay. Most world leaders are on board with it, no, and they agree to help produce the last of all is that Steve satellites. Holden? It seems like Spider-Man is the only person on Earth who has his doubts, and so he calls the Avengers into action, showing off his all-new Sinister Six-proof armor. Damn. He leads the charge against Otto and his fellow villains, but Otto's been preparing for them, and uses a series of gadgets and gizmos to take them down. His plan goes off without a hitch. Alright, let's finish this off satellites. It seems like Spider-Man is the only person on Earth who has his doubts, and so he calls the Avengers into action, showing off his all-new Sinister Six proof armor. He leads the charge against Otto and his fellow villains, but Otto's been preparing for them, and uses a series of gadgets and gizmos to take them down. His Damn, plan goes off without a hitch. I mean, Elektra was shot into space, but apart from that, leaving Spider-Man and Black Widow as the last remaining Avengers. Damn. Okay, so there's no one to help them. All of the other superhero teams are conveniently off-world. Black Widow's kinda useless, no offense. Once yeah, again, yeah, 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 that is, until they're both rescued at the last minute by Spider-Man's old mercenary pal, Silver Sable. They escape oh. on Sable's invisible jet Fire. and start hatching a plan to take down Otto. Otto still needs these last few satellites, so if they can break into those factories and stop production, then he can't complete his plan, right? One such factory is in North Africa, and so they fly the invisible jet there in the hopes of sabotaging it. Unfortunately, they are ambushed by the Sandman, who's oh, now made damn. up of all the sand in the entire Sahara Desert. <laughs> With the help of Horizon Labs, Spider-Man and his crew are able to detect Sandman's brain, the one singular sand particle which contains his consciousness and they manage to take him down. Bruh, Peter and the crew okay, then continue convenient. to sabotage factories all across the globe, running into several members of the Sinister Six. But it's no use, as Otto keeps launching satellites faster than they can shut them down, Damn. and now the only way to stop him is to confront him directly. Because Mysterio is a backstabbing bitch, they locate Otto's secret underwater base, with Spider-Man and Sable being sent to break in. Upon learning of this, Otto floods the lower levels of his base, during their break-in, Spider-Man and Sable cross paths with the Rhino, which shouldn't be a problem. There are two of them, one of him. All mm -hmm. they gotta do is go around him. But Rhino's like, mm, not so easy, you wall-crawling, web-spinning fuck, and prepares <laughs> to join the ranks of the coldest Spider-Man villain moments of all time. He grabs Sable with his massive Rhino hand and promises that he will not move. As the water rises and the air leaves his lungs, he will not move. Oh, he will only wow. loosen his grip when both he and Sable are dead, and he can finally oh, join his dead wow. life. And so Peter is given another choice. He can either go and stop Octavius, potentially saving billions of lives, or, or save he her. can fulfill his vow of letting no one die and save Sable. The answer is kind of obvious, yeah, and so Peter yeah. reluctantly leaves Sable to drown. In a climactic Smiling. confrontation with his greatest enemy, Otto admits that the whole environmentalist saving the world spiel was a lie, and that he actually intends to wipe out the human race. Damn. Not every single person though. He'll leave just less than 1% of the population alive, so they will preserve his legacy as the greatest supervillain of all time. <laughs> Unfortunately for Otto, he's stuck in a stalemate. With all of his arms being used to hold Spider-Man, he can't reach the control panel and activate his plan. If he tries to use one of his arms to reach said control panel, Spider-Man will get free and stop him from activating the satellites. And so, in a last-ditch effort to succeed, Otto completely abandons his life support and drags oh, his decaying bruh. husk of a body to towards the controls. With billions of lives depending on him, Peter once again uses his sheer indomitable will to defy his situation, possessing the impossible strength needed to free himself from Otto's arms. With the controls destroyed and his legacy ruined, Otto accepts his defeat and if the water doesn't take him out, he'll be dead in a couple minutes anyway. But despite all that Otto has done, despite the fact that he Sable's still saves dead, him? 
Peter still clings to his promise of no one dying. Otto is taken to the big supervillain prison known Bruh. as the Raft and hooked up to life support, only to be remembered as that one guy who didn't solve climate change. Upon his return, MJ throws Peter a massive party to say thank you for saving the world. Oh, are they gonna get back together? Uh, no. Just as Peter is about to take a break, suddenly the grave of Billy Connors is robbed, sparking a rumour that a certain villain is back. Who? Morbius. Yes, it turns oh. out that Morbius has dug up this child's grave in a supposed attempt to cure the lizard. Morbius and Spider-Man take to the sewers and use the combination of his son's DNA and Morbius' blood to transform him back into Kurt Connors. Nice. It's an apparent success and they celebrate Kurt's return, completely oblivious that Kurt's consciousness is still well and truly dead and only the lizard remains. The lizard then spends the next while pretending to be Kurt, faking grief over the loss of his son. His ultimate goal being to blend in until he can return himself back to his righteous, lizardish form. Right. However, during his time spent with the people of Horizon, he grows attached to being a human and all the joys of life, such as video games and Carly Rae Jepsen. It was 2012. Even when he's fully <laughs> okay. developed the formula to change him back, the lizard hesitates, genuinely considering giving up and living the wonders of human life. But when Spider-Man discovers his plan, he's forced to inject himself and mutates into his final form. He's about to gobble a bunch of civilians when he's suddenly interrupted by visions of his son, his wife, and his old self. These oh, illusions shit. distract him enough for Spider-Man to inject him with yet another cure and defeat him. It's a lukewarm victory at best. While the cure significantly weakened the lizard, it failed to turn him back, and the hope of Connors ever returning is it's lost. Done, so. At the very least, no one got hurt, and the lizard is dropped off at the raft. That's where Dr. Octopus is, hmm. If there's one thing I like about this era of Spider-Man, it's that it always felt like it was building up to something. There'd always be forces at play behind the scenes, or elements that would be introduced only to pay off like 40 issues later. And Damn. all of these things eventually led to the series' grand finale, Amazing Spider-Man issue 700. It's time for Otto Octavius to take his last breath, but before he does, he has a final final master plan. Okay. While Spider-Man may have saved the world a bunch of times, he kind of fucked up in a big way. How? To stop the Octobots, he plugged his brain into Otto's system. To cure Spider Island, he plugged his brain into Otto's system. Right. Even when designing his spider armor, he integrated Otto's system into the helmet. This whole time, he's been giving Otto access to his mind. Using his psychic oh. connection, Otto's been controlling a single Octobot, slowly crawling from the ocean floor all the way back to New York. It finds Spider-Man during a battle, and, using all of the brain data Otto's been collecting, completely rewrites Peter's brainwaves with his own, effectively oh. swapping their brains. And so while Peter is now stuck in a decrepit, dying body, Octopus Otto Octavius is, is now free to do whatever he wants Fuck. as Spider-Man, his final way of cheating death and getting revenge against his greatest enemy. That's as played. he up blood and his organs start to fail, Peter prays to God and asks what he possibly could have done to deserve this, begging not to die in a place like this. With not much to do, he speaks to the lizard in the next cell along, who reveals that the cure worked, and that he's now 100% Kurt Connors on the inside again. Peter urges him to tell someone, but Kurt would prefer to stay trapped in his cell, as right. punishment for what happened to his son. He only told Fair. Peter, because he's got hours to live and his secret will die with him. Okay, but he's Spider-Man, he's not just gonna give up and die, so what the hell is he gonna do? Yeah, well, yeah, if Otto true. has access to all of Peter's memories, he then it works the other of, way around. Yeah, 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 Peter yeah. searches through all of Otto's knowledge and experiences, his contingency plans, secret bases, certain memories of Otto and Aunt May on their wedding day that makes you want to bleach out your eyes. Eventually, <laughs> Peter makes the same psychic connection with the rogue Octobot, right, and uses just... it to call his fellow supervillains for help. His message is received, and he's then broken out of the raft by Scorpion, Hydro Man, and the infamous Paste Pot Pete. <laughs> Meanwhile, what is Otto up to in Spider-Man's body? Probably well, he's just... arranged a date with Mary Jane. Oh. And it's very clear that he wants more than that. I can't tell if it's meant to be intentionally funny, but as she's getting closer and unbuttoning his shirt, he's saying things like, Excellent! Another victory for the Master Planner! Hey, yo! <laughs> Finally, <laughs> Peter and MJ get back together, and it's Dr. fucking numbnuts Octavius That's in his That's crazy. Body. If you think about what's actually going on here, it's really fucked. But thankfully, they are interrupted by a news alert. Realizing that Peter will be coming to get his body back, Otto does the incredibly smart move of booking a round-trip flight to Belgium, thus ensuring that Peter will never be able to reach him, and fair, by the time the plane lands, Peter will be dead. 
Meanwhile, Peter's life is in the hands of Pastepot Pete, as the villains try to reattach his metal arms to his body. In doing so, they accidentally kill him, and oh. Peter is transported to the afterlife. It's there that he meets his dead parents, George oh. Stacy, Gwen, Tim Harrison, real ones no, and finally, Uncle Ben. Ben delivers a powerful speech about how proud of him he is, how Peter's built such an amazing life which he can't let Otto destroy, and encourages him to get back up one last time and fight. Back how? in the real world, Peter wakes up, ready to oh, get right, his okay. body back. Maybe but none of that matters, because Otto is about to leave for Belgium, and so the saving grace, the hero who saves the day, is not Spider-Man. It's not Pastepot Pete. It's in fact J. Jonah Jameson. How? While being interviewed about the breakout, Jameson calls Otto a buffoon, a loser, a complete imbecile who's never actually accomplished a single one of his evil plans. And it is that <laughs> one speech that makes Otto reconsider the flight and face Peter himself. Peter breaks into the police precinct where all Damn, of Otto's so old pride is being really, one of Otto. Damn, so pride really got in the way of the of a victory there, because you would have got the victory if you went, if you jumped on a plane. I'm assuming now you're not going to get a victory. swapping Octobots and is about to make a merry getaway when he's confronted by Carly Cooper. Peter tries to explain that it's actually him and that he's stuck in Otto's body, to which she's like, no, that's dumb, and shoots him point blank. Her bullet ricochets oh, off damn. Peter's arms and hits her instead. Oh, After damn. tying up Carly's wound and praying that she'll live, Peter and the villains go back to their secret base. Returning from the airport, Otto has rounded up all of Peter's loved ones in Avengers Tower, just in case the evil Dr. Octopus comes after them for their connections to Spider-Man. We've got Mary Jane, Aunt May, Jay, Jameson, the Daily Bugle, the guys at Horizon Labs. Otto also snitches to the police of the whereabouts of Dr. Octopus's secret base, and an army of publicly funded spider slayers are deployed to take <laughs> Peter out. Peter, Scorpion, and Hydro Man escape, leaving poor old Pasty Pete behind. No, and not if this Pasty scene Pete. Was a kick in the ball, it gets even worse. When they're alone, MG confesses to who she thinks is Peter, that she's always loved him, no matter what happened between them or whatever fucking devil deal they've gone through, <laughs> to which Otto responds by making out with her. Damn. Using his secret Avengers passcode, Damn. Peter enters Avengers Tower. If he can show someone like Iron Man the Octobot, then they'll understand what's going on and be able to help Peter get his brain back. Unfortunately, what? Otto has already thought of this and has activated his massive Octobots all across the globe, leaving the Avengers occupied and no one at home to help. Fuck. Not even Squirrel Girl. It is then that Otto accidentally lets slip that J. Jonah Jameson is in the building, piquing the interest of Scorpion and Hydroman, who ditch Peter for a chance at revenge. Right. Using his watery powers, Hydroman discovers Jameson and his loved ones, only to be sucked up and contained by Horizon Labs and their power of science. Scorpion breaks into the safe room and they're like, well, science can't save us now. And they all prepare to die. <laughs> but Jameson stands up to the Scorpion, claiming full responsibility for what he did to him in the past and sacrificing himself so that the others can get to safety. Oh, Before shit. the Scorpion can take action, however, Otto leaps in and uses that raw indomitable strength to take Scorpion's jaw clean off. Fuck. With literal minutes to live, oh, yeah, Peter Peter's always holding back, isn't it? grabs Otto and throws them both out the window. Now that Otto is significantly weakened, Peter activates the special Octobot and begins the mind transfer. But just like everything else, Otto has already thought of it oh, and came prepared. Fuck Otto uses me. the same raw strength to take Peter out, and Peter lies beaten and broken, seconds from death. Sure, his plan may have failed, but that Octobot managed to get into Otto's brain just the tiniest amount, leaving oh, okay. the tiniest psychic connection between the two. When Peter's whole life flashes before his eyes, he uses this connection to share the experience with Otto, and the two are flooded with all of Peter's memories and the values he's carried throughout his life. The kindness instilled into him by Aunt May and Uncle Ben. The importance of never giving up no matter how difficult things get. Mm. How tragic it is to lose someone and learning to move on despite it. The meaning of true love and how you don't truly appreciate how valuable it is until it's cut short. Fair. Even saving Otto's life despite all that he did. Otto is overwhelmed. From his perspective, he is Peter Parker. These are all things that have happened to him. Mm. And the reminder of all of this completely shifts his philosophy. As the icing on the cake, Peter tells him that with great power, there must come great responsibility. Peter takes one last look at his loved ones, makes Otto promise to keep them safe, and with that, Peter Parker dies. Fuck. This was of course very controversial at the time. I really could imagine. Killing off their main character on Stanley's birthday. But to me, this is almost a perfect ending for Peter that represents who he is as a character. Rock. For most of his life, Peter was never rewarded for- 
Why is it Pia da- so Pia so Pia just dies in the comics? Fuck. But I guess Spider Man lives on, but it's not it's not Peter Parker. It's Art For his Octavio. Comics, nor was he able to really tell anyone. Peter, because I guess they kind of shared the same memory. You know what, what I mean? Doing. He simply did it because it was the right thing to do, and yeah. that was more than enough. Peter does not get a happy ending. There's no reward at he the end. Really he really dies as a villain, with no one to mourn him, no one to celebrate his life or acknowledge his sacrifice. For to real? most people, this would be the worst fate imaginable. But Peter doesn't care. Even though he's utterly defeated, even though he could easily give up and rest, he spends his last moments trying to find the good in someone, and he dies perfectly content with the knowledge that he's done the right thing and that his loved ones are safe. He's brave, selfless, and full of hope. And so, as Peter Parker is laid to rest, Otto Octavius takes his place and promises to be Spider-Man. A better Spider-Man. Some could even say a superior Spider-Man. Fuck! I... I'm, I'll be real with you, though. That was not the end that I ever expected from fucking Spider-Man. I'll be 100% real. That is insane. Like, what? Because I always thought, I always thought Spider-Man was their moneymaker. Do you know what I mean? I always thought, because I heard Spider-Man, when, when Marvel was in a rut, Spider-Man saved them. So, uh, you know, I never would have thought they would have killed him off. Fuck me, that is... It's actually kind of sad. Everything, everything that he's kind of done, not even to be rewarded, not even to be... I know it doesn't matter to him, but do you know what I mean? Like, fuck. Wow. All right, well... Uh, fucking Alex, thank you for this video. That was amazing. Like I said, I'll leave the video uh, if you want to check about me yapping in the comments and the description down below. So make sure you check it out. Um, yeah, catch you, man, in a bit. Peace.